Okay. Um, Sam Kishnick is an urban wildlife biologist with Texas Parks and Wildlife Department, serving the east side of the DFW Metroplex. He previously worked as a nature educator with the city of Mansfield at Oliver Nature Park as a naturalist at the Fort Worth Nature Center and Refuge as a science interpreter with the Fort Worth Museum of Science and History, as a botanist with Brit, as an instructor at Weatherford College. And um, he got his master's degree from Tarleton State, Tarleton. <laughs> My choir director was from Tarleton. So anyway, uh, and a uh, study in genetics of pocket gophers of all fun things. Um, with his topic will be on moths today. So I would like to go ahead and introduce Sam. Okay, get this one there. Bring up my notes. And then you go there. Right down there. There you uh -huh. There you go. You're on your own. Uh, thank you so much. Can you hear me all right? Can everyone hear my voice? Uh, thank you so much for letting me come to the first gathering back, almost normalcy. We're almost at normalcy. Uh, so it's so many, I, I'm seeing so many eyes and I assume a lot of smiles um, out there. I can only assume. Um, but we are going to be talking about, can you see that on the screen at all? No, you can't. Let's see here, hold on one second. That's not how John taught me. Is there a share button? No, that wasn't it. Was me. Hold on one button? second. No, Dorothy, Dorothy. Yeah, I'm going to do this. I'm going to go to this. Your slides are at the end. Okay. Okay. Can you all see that? All right. Can you see uh, the joke there of two fireflies and a moth um, staring at their hiney? Yes. Can you see that? All right. And maybe those lights too. And if you're online, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I hope that you're seeing the screen. Okay, there too. Chime in on the chat if you have any questions. I'll be hitting the questions at the end of our little talk today. So Abby, thank you so much for the introduction. My name is Sam Kieschnick. I work for Texas Parks and Wildlife and I'm an urban wildlife biologist. So what does an urban wildlife biologist do? Well, I kind of work with people. I tend to work more with people than I do with coyotes. The coyotes do their own thing. And then people either get their panties in a wad about seeing a coyote or, uh, you know, they find ways to live with the organisms that we share the urban ecosystem with. So one of the interesting things that I've experienced from the pandemic is people being stuck at home. They're starting to notice more nature. And that's a beautiful thing because nature has been waiting out there to be noticed by so many folks. So glass half full part of the pandemic uh, is that tonight I'm going to be, or tonight, today, I don't even know what time it is. Today I'm going to be talking about a critter that most of us may not recognize the beauty or the importance of, and that is moths. Have you heard of moths? Do you know what a moth is? You know, before I got into moths, I thought that there were three species. There was the brown one, the gray one and the brown with gray on it. And that was it. That's all I thought that there was of moths out there. The truth is there is beauty in the moths. And I hope that at the end of the, the presentation that you start to appreciate it, just like what people did during the pandemic when they saw nature out there, there are moths that are just waiting for us to appreciate them. So I'll be talking about the magnificence of these moths. Whoops. Hold on one second, I gotta go to the... Ah! Forgive me one second. 
going to go back to the beginning of it. I went all the way to the end. I got so excited. No, I think I got it. Okay, so here is the question. Holy moly, there's some yellow on there. Sorry about that. The question is, what lives in your yard? Do you know? Are you sure? I bet you a nickel and a quarter that there are some itty bitty tiny bugs that have existed in your landscape for as long as you've had your landscape. And this is a pretty cool thing. It's a great thing that those critters exist with us and amongst us. And it's a question of why. Why do we put in plants? Why do you garden? Why do you put in these plants? And your answer may be, well, you know, I like to see the flowers. I like the foliage, or maybe it's I like the birds. I like the pollinators, the butterflies that come to those flowers too. The reality is there are thousands of species that are using your landscaping as a refuge. And some of those are moths. And if you want birds, you need moths. And some people even say that. My ornithologist friends say, well, a moth is just bird food with wings. And, you know, it's a weird thing for me to say it, but part of the goal or the role of a moth is to be food. You know, they're shooting high. They're shooting for the sky. I hope to be food someday. Well, the truth is that's, that's how it is. Uh, with a lot of our moths and a lot of our insects, they are food for other Critters. So if you want birds, you need moths. And I don't mean to patronize you with this. I, I know you probably were in second grade at one time and you learned about the food chain and the food web, things that eat other things. You've heard about this stuff before. Um, and it sort of blew out that a little bit, but John Muir has a quote, when we try to pick out anything by itself, we find it hitched to everything else in the universe. So next time that you kill a mosquito, think about that. Think about that. Uh, then, you know, it's hitched to everything else in the universe. So for moths, almost all of their stages are as food for something else. Now, I, I do one of these things. Um, I do mothing. I'll talk about that in a little bit. But I do this moth thing in my backyard, and my wife is a big quilter. Um, she collects fabrics. She has this thing called a stash. Have you heard about this? Do you know about this thing? And it just grows and grows and grows. Um, I tell our therapist that we have a very healthy relationship. Um, one of the things that we do is I will drive her to a fabric store, and she will go into the fabric store, and I will go to the ditch outside the fabric store and look at bugs and moths and, and critters like that. So we have a very healthy relationship, I think. But whenever I'm outside mothing in my backyard, in our backyard, I will open the door and sometimes some moths will fly in. And she says, no, my stash. Because some people know moths as, as cloth eaters. Well, the truth is only a few species of moths actually do that. Most of the moths that we see are not interested in our favorite sweaters or anything like that. There are a few that are agricultural pests and a couple that, that feed on, on wool and cloths. And maybe if you've opened up a bag of sunflower seed for birds and you haven't used it in a while and moths fly out, has that ever occurred? Yeah, the, there are some that feed on grains and things like that, but most of them are not agricultural pests. So when we look at the life cycle of the moth, we'll hit each one of these stages. Again, I'm not trying to patronize you. I bet you know the, the life cycle of a moth, but we'll start out with the egg. And the egg with moths, we typically have a lot of eggs. And the first meal of the caterpillar is usually that protein egg case. So the very first meal that, that a little caterpillar gets is that high protein egg case. And then we have the larva, uh, the word for the larval 
stage in our moths, our butterflies, is the caterpillar. And what's interesting about caterpillars, not all of them, but some of them are very host specific. In other words, one type of plant that they go for. You may think of monarchs and milkweeds. Have you heard about this before? You know about monarchs and milkweeds? Sure, that the monarch is host specific on milkweeds. The truth of the matter is a lot of our butterflies and moth are host specific. It may not be as specific as just the single genus, as the, the milkweeds and monarchs, it may be grasses, or it may be mints, or it may be uh, stages that a certain species will go after. But their main objective in life is to eat. They eat and they poop. I mean, you can think about a child is it, very similar, okay, to eat and to poop. That is what they do. And that is growth. I mean, we call that growth too, all the metabolic processes. And in this stage, their main objective is to eat, to get as much energy as they can for the next stage of their lives. For a lot of our moths, we have cocoons, or I should say, for all of our moths, we have the pupil stage, and that is a cocoon. Not to get too much into semantics, but with butterflies, we have a chrysalis, and with moths, we have a cocoon. The neat thing about moth uh, cocoons is usually they are in or near the ground. And this time of year, there's something that we can do for moths. And you may have to ask the HOA or whatever, but leaving some of the leaves is important. It's important to leave some of the leaves, maybe not all of them, and maybe it's okay if you're trying to get out of doing chores, that's all right. Just say, I'm doing this for the moth. That's why I don't wanna rake the leaves today. But leaving the leaves is good for nature. It's good for nature. It's the process of the, the re recycling those nutrients. That's why the tree, if it's a deciduous tree, they lose their leaves. It's to break down that carbon to reabsorb it later on. Well, for our moths and for a whole bunch of other critters, that is habitat. So the moths are habitat for, uh, or the leaves are habitat for a lot of critters out there. And then we have our, the adult stage, and this is what we call the moth in this group. I don't wanna bore you too much with the, the Latin here, but Lepidoptera is the order of our moths and butterflies, and Lepido means scale, Patera means wings. Moths and butterflies have scales on their wings. And nature has played with these scales to produce some really cool patterns, some different colors, different reflections of the sun. I'll show you some examples of that in a second. For some of our moths, actually for most of our moths, the adult stage is quite short. It's to find that mate, to mate, and then lay eggs and die. That's kind of what they do as, as adults. But they use these scales for some kind of interesting things. Actually, could I open that up to the floor? Why do you think a moth or a butterfly have scales that come off? Hmm. Why do you think a moth or a butterfly would have scales that come off? And if you're watching online on chat, Go ahead and write in some comments on why you think the scales fall off of a butterfly or moth. What do you think, Abby? So Abby said to escape. Keep talking, Abby. So Abby ruined it for everybody because you're right. Um, yeah, we think it's probably to escape. And the very first moths, one of their main predator were spiders. And as a spider, that sticky spider web, if you fly into a spider web, well, if you lose some of those scales, you can fly off just fine. So perhaps, and I think, Abby, I think you nailed it, uh, it's for defense to escape from predators. I have a question. Yes, so a question. So, when you kill a moth, you know, you get like this gut. Yes. So we have a question here. So when we see that dust, whenever we touch a, a moth or whenever we rub it or whenever we just remove it, some of that dust comes off 
And those are the little scales. So the, the picture that I'm showing right here, that's a electron micrograph. So it's a high tailed micros microscopic image of them. The scales are really, really tiny and they look like dust. So exactly right, that's the kind of dust that we see. Those are the scales. Um, one of my favorite books, and if you're ever looking for any book suggestions, this is one of my favorite ones. It's called For Love of Insects. It's a good book, it's a great book. Um, it's by Thomas Eisner, who's a chemical ecologist. It's a beautiful, beautiful book. It really is my favorite. And he said that when people talk about butterflies versus a moth, that it's sort of like talking about the Romans and the barbarians. So way back when, during the Roman reign, if you were a Roman, you would have the Romans, and then everything else, if you weren't a Roman, you were a barbarian. But the reality is the barbarians were of thousands of different countries, ethnicities and cultures and all that sort of stuff. The same thing with butterflies and moths. We sometimes look at butterflies being the pretty ones, they're the Romans, and then everything else, the moths, are like the barbarians. But I would argue there's a lot of interest in the barbaric tribes of moths. Generally speaking, and sorry about that, um, the yellow markings on there. I think someone may have uh, drawn something on there, but hopefully it's not too distracting. Generally, moths are nocturnal. In other words, they're active at night. You may know this when you turn on the, the front, front door uh, light. But there's another physiological difference with our butterflies and moths, well, with the moths, they tend to have more linear antenna and the males versus females. This is something you could do to impress or annoy um, someone that you love or don't love. Um, you can tell if it's a male or a female moth. The male moth has filiform antenna. In other words, there's a lot of sort of things coming off of them, kind of like a fern leaf or fern frond. Whereas the females will have kind of the more linear straight one. Anybody have a guess on why that would be? What do you think? Anybody know what antenna bugs use those antenna for? Not grabbing, that's a good guess, not grabbing. Smelling, it's the same sort of thing as smell. All the chemoreceptors, the, similar to like what's in our nose, the chemoreceptors on the antenna help the moth sense pheromones. So the males will have all of those filiform antenna, all of those little things full of chemoreceptors to smell the female's pheromones. So again, we'll do that to annoy or impress uh, people on male versus female. There are way more moths than there are butterflies. Globally, around 160,000 species, probably a lot more than that. In the United States, there's 13,000 283. So that's 13,280 more than I thought there were with the brown, the gray, and the brown with gray. In Texas, we have, give or take, over 5,000 species of moths. Pretty dang incredible. With our moths, size can quote unquote matter. And we sometimes call it microleps and macroleps, or big ones and little ones, basically. That little one that you're seeing on the right-hand side, depending on how you're looking at it, that's on a finger. So this is an itty bitty tiny, maybe two or three millimeter, little itty bitty tiny thing. And compare that with one called the Black Witch that I'll talk about in a little bit, that has a wingspan of over seven inches. So far about 3000 species we've documented using this tool called the iNaturalist that I'll talk about in a second. So let's do, um, let's look at some of these moths together. And I wanna do a show of hands, since some of us are in person here, a show of hands on if you've seen these before. Has anyone seen this one, the Polyphemus moth? This is a big one, all right, we had a person that's seen this one. Yeah, a couple of people have seen this one. This is a big moth. So when I say big, I mean about five, five inches, give or take. So a really, really pretty moth. An interesting thing about this is they have vestigial mouth parts. In other words, they don't eat. They can't eat as adults. They get all of the energy from the caterpillar stage. So they don't nectar, they don't do anything like that. 
and they're alive just long enough, about a week or so before they die uh, and pass on to the next generation, hopefully. It's named Polyphemus from, did you read? Oh, what is it? The Iliad or the Odyssey, one of those two of the Cyclops named Polyphemus. He's the one that Odysseus jabbed the, uh, the stake in its eye and Odysseus called his name no body. And then the Cyclops, after his eye was jabbed, yelled to Poseidon, his father. He said, nobody stabbed me. Nobody stabbed me. I guess it was Homer's try attempt at a joke with that story, maybe. I don't know. But this Polyphemus uh, moth has those two big eyes or a single eye on those hind wings. A show of hands, has anybody seen a Luna moth? before. Good. A few more folks. They're pretty cool, aren't they? The people that have raised your hand, they're pretty dang cool. These guys, they feed, the caterpillars feed on sweet gums uh, and some of the, the pecans and walnuts that you land AC. But these, oh, actually, before, whoops, can you see that? Can you tell me male or female on this one? I hear some male. A show of hands. How many of you think that this is a boy? Raise your hand, okay? How many of you think this is a girl? Raise your hand. How many of you don't wanna raise your hand? Raise your hand. Okay, good. So this is this is a boy, this is a male. If you can see, and I'm sorry if it's kind of hard to see there, but it has a lot of filamentose antenna. So very fuzzy antenna for lots of chemoreceptors there. Um, how about this one, boy or girl? Mm, can you see those antenna, sort of? So we gotta, yeah, they're kind of hard to see. I wish I had it here in my hand. I'd let you all see up close. But this one's probably a male. Still has those bit of fuzz on the antenna, extra chemoreceptors. Another moth species that cannot eat. It cannot eat as an adult. So all of the energy it gets, it gets from that larval stage, the caterpillar. A show of hands. How many of you have seen this guy? Come in to visit your lantana or some of the verbena. Yeah, this guy is one of our um, crepuscular or diurnal moths. So not all of them are nocturnal. This one is active sometimes during the dusk and dawn, if it's crepuscular or during the day diurnal. And they have that almost like a hummingbird movement on the wings. I see some nods of people that have seen this. And in the chat, if you're watching online, I want you to write, I've seen this, if you have seen this before. But they're beautiful, beautiful moths. And it's very high energy. Yes, a question. Do any of the moths bite? So a great question. No, none of the moths that we have here bite. However, this blew my mind. A new discovery about maybe 20 years ago in Papua New Guinea, there's actually a moth called the vampire moth. And what it does, see, I know it's so cool. Um, it has these little uh, serrated edges on its tongue and it, it flies over to someone sleeping or a critter sleeping, and like a little razor blade, it cuts a little nodule in there and laps up the blood. We don't have those um, here. So none of the moths that we have bite or sting. So a good question there. With this one though, it does eat. So this one has to produce a lot of energy to fly around. It has that high uh, intensity, wing beat of these. I really like these too is next time that you see one, I know it's a little bit late in the year for this. Hopefully you can remember for next year. When you see one, usually they're so focused on pollinating, they're so focused on nectaring, you can get right on top of them. And you can get really, really close, way closer than you could a hummingbird. And one thing that I did too, is you can put your little ear next to the flapping wings and it's cool to hear that buzz. But these guys, um, they are, uh, really interesting. However, the caterpillar of these, anybody grow tomatoes? Anybody grow tomatoes? Few people grow tomatoes. Yeah, do you know the tomato hornworms? Meet the adults. I know, it kind of breaks your heart when you're squishing one. Okay, it doesn't break your heart for long. Okay, I, I saw that in your eyes. Um, but yes, the tomato hornworms or the hornworms in general, those turn into the hummingbird moth. So it, it's kind of a, an interesting example. You can also see, and those of you that have 
wrestled with this caterpillar before. If you leave one on a tomato plant, by the end of the day, you'll have no more tomato. Well, it's for all of the energy intensity of its adult lifespan too. So next time you squish one, just remind yourself, oh man, I'm gonna miss out on seeing that adult as you eat your uh, tomato. A uh, show of hands, has anybody ever seen this one? The IO moth. IO moths have a really interesting defense. And normally during the day, they'll just be chilling out on under a branch or in some leaf litter. But when they get spooked, what they do is lift up those front wings and expose those back ones. What do you think this is saying to the potential predator, like a bird? I'm big, I'm scary, look at my eyes. Oh, what big eyes you have, as, as someone said once. Yeah, this is the defense of our eye all moth, has those fake eyes that scare off a potential little bird. How about this one? Has anybody been lucky enough to see a black witch before? You have, oh, oh. Um, so I wanna tell you a couple things about this. There's some really interesting mythology about this. Another name for it is Mariposa del Muerte, the butterfly of death. So when you see one, and some people will see them outside of their front door, it means a couple things. It either means that a loved one is visiting you. It could mean that you're gonna win the lottery, or it could mean that you're going to die soon. So I don't know if you get to choose which one it is. I'm not sure if that's in the rule book, but there's a really interesting mythology. This is the biggest moth that we have. So around seven inches, and you've seen one before, knows that it's big. This is a big, big uh, moth. They migrate as well. You know, the monarchs get all the credit for migrating bugs, but other bugs migrate too. Some of our dragonflies migrate. Some of our moths do as well. This is a Central American, South Texas, Mexican species, and it migrates up north too. And to me, it almost looks like a bat when they're flying around. It's a really, really big guy. You may have seen one of these before. This is another one of our moths. A show of hands, has anybody seen one of these? Sometimes they'll go by our Texas kidney wood or our uh, mist flowers, Greg mist flowers, stuff like that. This is one of our uh, diurnal or during the day flyer. It feeds upon the tree of heaven, which is a hellish plant. It's a non-native species that can really take over, but uh, the Allianthus webworm is the name of it. But I would argue there's some beauty in that, don't you think? I think so too. A southern flannel moth, really cute, a charming, fuzzy little thing. You may not know it in this stage, but you might know it in this stage. Uh, oh, I love that sound. Um, yes, the old uh, These guys have stinging hairs. A show of hand, has anybody ever touched one before? Yeah. When I was a little kid, we had a tree house on old oak. They are oak specialists, so they will feed on oak trees. But there was a tree house that I had as a little kid, and these little asps would always sit at the top uh, level of the ladder, and I would always get stung by them. But they're really interesting. I think they're kind of cool. They look like little walking toupees, uh, you know, over the landscape. But in the adult stage, a really cool looking critter. But this is the defense mechanism here is little toxins at the end of all of those hairs. So be cautious if you see one of these. Moon seed moth, nature has played with patterns. So it's played with the patterns of those scales to create some really cool, intricate designs. This one called the moon seed moth, it feeds on the Carolina snail seed. It's a vine that you may have pulled out many times that has the red berries. Uh, it's, it'd be annoying, super annoying, but this is what the adult of, of the caterpillar that feeds on that. So if, if you leave some of it out there, you know, it's one of those things that it's like, okay, do I want the moth or do I want that uh, plant gone? If you leave that, you might get the moths. Some of them have incredible yoga poses. I don't know what the pose is, but his nose is touching the rear end. So that, I think that's advanced level yoga on this one. This is the eggplant leaf roller. The caterpillars of this species, what they do, they feed on the solanaceae, 
or the nightshade, the eggplant family, and the caterpillars roll up the leaf of the, the nightshade and basically eat their blanket. So it's how these bees live, kind of an interesting thing. And they also have that weird sitting posture. Some of our moths, you identify it by the sitting posture of it. You can see it on the white sheet here, but you might not be able to sit, see it if it's sitting on some lichen on the edge of a trunk. So this is a wonderful example of camouflage, and it's looking a lot like our lichen, this one called the laudable arches. And speaking of lichen, does everybody know what lichen is? Have you heard of lichen before? It's that stuff that looks kind of like algae, kind of like moss, but it's actually a weird relationship between a fungus and a cyanobacteria. Well, there are some moth species that have caterpillars that feed on that lichen. This is the example of one called the lichen moth. These super, super pretty here called emerald moth. The adult is really, really amazing but the caterpillars are especially interesting. Do you see it? It's hard to see and you may have to squint and sort of move your head a little bit to the side. What this caterpillar does is it has a sticky back and it takes off the petals of a flower, or in this case, the ray flowers, and glues it on its back. And then it stays on the plant and eats the little flowers on there. Pretty tremendous camouflage. Here's another example of it. And this is using a liatris, so our gay feather, blazing star. So it takes off the little petals or the little ray flowers or disc flowers, glues it on its back. What's also mind blowing is once they lose their color on the back, it takes those off and replaces them with fresh flowers. So an amazing critter that exists out there with us. And that's what the adult looks like too. This group is called the geometrids. You may know them as inchworms. Geo meaning earth, metrid meaning measure. Inchworms measure the earth inch at a time. Some of them are just cool. Uh, this one is one called the sculptured moth. Uh, has some really intricate cool colors and the size of this is about a quarter of an inch. So it's a pretty small thing but quite beautiful. One of our aquatic moths, and the adult doesn't live in water, but the caterpillar does. These are typically found close to streams and ponds. Do you see what I see? You may have to twist your head and look at it a little bit sideways, but some people think it looks a little bit like a jumping spider. Do you see it? Can you see it? You may have to squint, but some people see what looks like a jumping spider with those eyes on the hind wing could be a, an example of mimicry to keep itself safe. Some of our moths are called leaf miners. And I don't know if you've seen this before, but if you look at one of your leaves in your garden, you may notice this little maze pattern in there. Have you ever seen that before? The leaf miners do this, little itty bitty tiny caterpillars, and they go under the epidermis or under the outside layer of the leaf and eat on that mesoderm and they form these little tunnels or mazes in there. A lot of those turn into little tiny moths, bless you. So I, I talked about what, maybe 12 of the 5,000 moths that we have. And each one of those moths has a unique life history, has a unique host plant, all this cool stuff. So I argue that moths are just waiting for you to appreciate them, waiting for you as you look outside, look at some of the brown and gray bugs out there. I challenge you, I dare you, I double dare you to take a closer look. Take a closer look at some of those. So you, it's pretty easy to do this too. When do you look and where do you look? Well, typically nighttime is the best time to see moths. You want a place ideally with low light pollution. However, in my backyard, I live in Fort Worth in a very urban area. Even at my black lights, a lot of moths show up. We have a few hundred species that I've documented just in the backyard. So it doesn't necessarily have to be an area of low light pollution. The best results are when the weather is at or above 60 degrees. 
So we're getting a little bit late in the year to, to do this, but you know, you never know. Sometimes in December, we'll have an 80 degree evening. There's a, an interesting book called Why Moth Hate Thomas Edison. And it talks about why some of our moths are attracted to lights. And the truth is we don't really know. We don't know exactly why they come to light, but they do. Some people think that perhaps they're using like a celestial body to move around, to help them navigate, perhaps. Maybe it's the, what would look like the moon reflecting on a body of water, perhaps. Some people even say that it um, activates a certain chemoreceptor on the, or the pheromones uh, on their antenna. A lot of possibilities here, but we don't know exactly why moths and other insect, nocturnal insects are attracted to lights, but they are. If you want to get into this, uh, first of all, I gotta warn you, if you get into this, if you get deep into it, you won't wanna sleep again. Uh, you, your circadian rhythm is all jacked up from it. But nighttime is the best time to see them, so staying up a little bit at night and going to get some of the party lights or the UV light, that's a wider spectrum of light, and that tends to attract a lot more of these critters. Once you get really into it, you can go to these specific sites like BioQuip to get some of these specific UV lights and even mercury vapors that has a broad spectrum of, of light and attracts a whole bunch of critters. Now, the light itself probably brings in a lot, but I like to have what acts kind of like a mirror behind the light. So the white reflective uh, sheet behind the light acts a little bit like a mirror reflecting that light off into the, the whole ecosystem. I like to take pictures of moths. Do any of you have a camera? Do y'all have a camera? I know a lot of our cameras have been replaced by these, which these can have pretty good cameras too, no doubt about it. But I find that whenever I take pictures of something and zoom in on the picture, you can see so much more detail. The same thing, especially when it comes to moths and mothing. So I will get a point and shoot. I have a little point and shoot camera that I'll take pictures of and I'll use a headlamp or a little flashlight to play around with the reflection of those scales. So I mentioned give or take 5,000 species of moths. They're a lot more challenging to identify than say bird or even, well, plants, there's a lot of plants too. Plants can be super hard to identify as well. If you were to have a field guide of all the plants of Texas, it would be a monster volume. The same thing with our moths. But even the best field guide to our moths only includes just a fraction of them. But this is a great book of the Peterson Field Guide to Moths. There's some great websites for this too. One of them is called the Moth Photographers Group. And I know this sounds kind of silly, and I don't know when you came in and heard that you're gonna hear a program of moths. I heard some people say under their mask, boring, lame. And you know, it can kind of feel like that at first. But some people would argue, you know, the same thing with flowers. And I've seen all different colored flowers, but as you well know, you know, just the colors are one part of the vastness of diversity of plants. The same thing with bugs and with moths. There is such intricacy in the, the patterns and the behaviors, all that sort of stuff. So there are websites dedicated to the different species of moths. This one called Moth Photographers Group uh, it has this walkthrough plate series that you can kind of scroll around to look to see if you can find the match, kind of like a yearbook looking for um, a friend. And then Bug Guide is another great website that I use a lot. This gives you all of the insects, or not all of the ones, but a lot of the insects documented throughout mostly North America, north of Mexico. If you do submit a picture here, it can be kind of a, I don't want to say cold or mean place, but identifiers really want it to be cropped. So you have to have that picture just narrowed down to just the moth. I'm crazy about this tool. I literally am bonkers about this tool. 
Now, Abby mentioned my uh, degree is in population genetics. So I used a DNA sequencer for my thesis, you know, a multi-million dollar tool that told me the nucleotides that make up life. With a lot of bias, I can say that this is the most powerful tool that I've touched. iNaturalist, it is so powerful. I, I love it. I'm just crazy about it. There's an app for this, and you can use this to identify pretty much anything, any critters. You've got it on your phone right there. Attaboy. It's a great tool. It is a great tool. Just a tool. It is just a tool, but it's a tool that helps me engage with nature. And it helps me learn the names of a lot of moths out there. Just real quick, and I won't go into the weeds of how to use iNaturalist. It's kind of like doing a presentation on baseball. I mean, I can show you what a baseball looks like. I can show you what a bat looks like. I can show you what a glove looks like. I can show you the rules of baseball. But how do you learn baseball? You go out and play. Same thing with this tool is when you grab iNaturalist, going out and playing with it is the best way to learn it. So I encourage you to play with it too. Mark your calendars. Mark your calendars. Um, in July, there is the National Moth Week. I know, it's a, it's a global event. I can't wait. It's like the, the Olympics for mothers. Um, we do a lot of mothing events around Dallas-Fort Worth. I know there's, there are some of you that are master naturalists in here as well. We do a lot of mothing programs where we go out to a place. Um, we did several of these at Leela, Lake Louisville Environmental Learning Area. We did one at Spring Creek Preserve up in Garland. All over the place we do this. Uh, we go out with our lights, with our batteries, put up sheets. It's a very public program too, so stay tuned. Um, I'll let you know next year in July of the events that we've got going on, um, and they're great fun. Yes, ma'am, a question. Do they breed year-round? A great question. No. They breed only during kind of the warm months here in Texas. So typically spring, summer, early fall is typically when, when they breed. A great question, though. And that's when we see the most activity of, of moth as well. Yes, sir. So a good question about the migration, the, mi the migratory moths and their lifespan. The migratory moths can live a little bit longer and they much, much like, oh, uh, well, I won't go back to it, but the black witch, that's a big moth, a big critter that has a lot of energy reserve to fly around. The adult stage can live maybe for a month. So it's not even that long. They'll fly up somewhere, lay their eggs, fly back down south, lay their eggs again. So it's that generational cycle too. But it's kind of a bummer to be an adult moth is you don't have that long of a life to, to live. Uh, there is an upcoming book. So once you start to get into moths, you'll want every Christmas list will have either a black light or a moth book. Um, there's a book coming out by uh, my dear friends, the Webbers, and uh, it's called The Native Host Plants for Texas Moths. It's a field guide, stay tuned for that. And I like to address this question, and sometimes it keeps me up at night. Who cares? The question of who cares? I mean, honestly, it's something that I wrestle with a lot. I love bugs, I love plants, I love the little tiny weeds that have itty bitty tiny flowers that you have to get on your hands and knees to, to realize. What is the relevancy of these things? Well, it's a question that I struggle with. I don't want it to be a rhetorical question. It's something I actively wrestle with every night. You know, who cares about my favorite bug? I like to argue though, that a healthy ecosystem has diversity. Biodiversity in the ecosystem means clean water, clean air, lots of species out there. It's a bioindication of the health of an area. So if we see a lot of different moths in an area, it means that we have a lot of different plants in the area. You can directly correlate the two because a lot of our moths have host plants, specific plants, it means that their host has to be somewhere nearby. 
So if I were to have just a monoculture out there of one species of plants, nothing else, I wouldn't have much moth diversity. And because I wouldn't have much moth diversity, I wouldn't have much bird diversity. I wouldn't have much lizard diversity or mammal diversity out there. So we like to say that diversity begets or brings diversity. So if I can leave you with any, any little note today, I encourage you to play with diversity in your landscape. Try some new plants out. Try some of these plants. And I know it can be difficult because we sweat, we cry over these plants and as they're getting nibbled by that little tiny bug. Try to recognize that that little bug is food for something else. That little tiny bug, and I know it's a challenge when I have paid for that plant and I have struggled over that plant sort of existing, but if you can allow some of it to be food for the other critters, your yard will be much more alive than another place too. So plant diversity, well, plant diversity of plants. There you go. That's the big point, and you can see the correlation of plant diversity with moth diversity. With that, I would love to address any other questions or comments. Yes, and I'll repeat them too. I, I heard you know, you're talking about they reproduce during the summer months. They don't live long. How do they overwinter? A great question. So how the heck does a moth survive Storm Uri? You know, like in February, do you remember? Do you remember February? Yeah, although I gotta, I gotta say, it's bad of me. I'm a big native plant guy. I'm not, a, not quite a native plant Nazi, but almost. Um, but when, as I was driving down and seeing some of the Indian hawthorns that are frozen in some of that landscaping, I just got a good giggle out of it. I got a good giggle. Um, and it's big, bad of me, I know. But how can any life survive in the winter? And I'm actually going to go back to a slide. Uh, yes, and you already know what it is. So even during the, the bitter, bitter cold, and it's kind of a nice thing, during February, we had that, uh, we had ice and we had snow that came with it. And believe it or not, that actually adds as a blanket, as a layer of insulation that closer to the surface of the ground, because there was that 32 degrees freezing point up above, it didn't get much colder than that below the ice or below the, the, the snow. So it acted like a blanket. A lot of our critters, the native ones, still survive. They survive because they went into the leaf litter. They went into the ground. With many of their um, life stages, it's the pupil or the cocoon stage that overwinters. Uh, not with all of them. Sometimes it's the eggs. Rarely is it the adults that, that live overwinter. But it's one of the things that I encourage you, and you can use this as an excuse to get out of work. I, on behalf of the state of Texas, I give you permission to leave some of the leaves. Leave some of the leaves. It's good for nature when you do so. Does that address the question? Good. Uh, anybody else have a question? Yes, and there's some uh, chat questions too. Yes. Last summer, I had a very large moth that looked maybe a little bit like the witch. Yeah. Three inches across, and it was in bark color, and it would land on my so a great question. So you saw a lovely, and I think you said the word lovely. Yes, a lovely moth uh, that was there. I thought I heard that. Maybe it's, maybe it's just my hearing. A lovely, magnificent, beautiful moth, beautiful moth that came. A pretty good size one, and it showed up on your door, and it showed up a couple nights as well. Was it the same individual? Maybe. <laughs> It's probably my best, best answer. So sometimes they will sit there or they'll find their hiding spot or their spot that they like, and they will stay there for a while until the conditions are right. If it's a female, it may have been sitting there uh, emoting or, or sort of giving off some of the pheromones, waiting for the potential mate to come. Uh, so that's probably what it was. It was, was one that was just finding that right spot, enjoying your patio or your front porch and that's where it, it came back to. Uh, no. Do I know the name? No. A beautiful, gorgeous, lovely. Uh, it does have a name. It does have a name. So next time that you see one, uh, grab that photo of it, toss it onto iNaturalist, 
and some folks will help you out with the name of it. Good deal. Uh, yes, a couple of questions on. Sure, the great book. One of my, it really is my favorite book. It's called For Love of Insects. And it's by Thomas Eisner. He's a chemical ecologist. In other words, he views the world, or he viewed, passed away a couple years ago. He viewed the world in chemicals, in all of the chemistry of how nature communicates with each other, with other critters, other species. Really fascinating book. Um, but that's that's a good one for love of insects. So a good question, I'll repeat that. So looking at our asp, our lovely, beautiful, amazing asp, I think those are the words that came with the question. Um, so on the hairs of this, yes, it does have the stinging hairs as a caterpillar, but what about the fuzz on our adults? No, those don't have the stinging hairs of, of the pupil stage. So these guys are wonderful to pet. Feel free. They, maybe they purr as you pet them. You have to listen closely. But this one, I, I would not test that with, with a, a caterpillar. Any other questions? Okay. Anybody else have any other questions? Um, I'll be sticking around a little bit afterwards if you were scared to ask me a question uh, later, uh, later on. Also, my contact right there. I asked the state for the longest possible email address, and they gave it to me. So um, that's my email address. I'm also really active on iNaturalist. Sam Biology is my username on there. So uh, thank you so much. So good to see many of you in person. Um, and thank you so much for your time. Uh, yeah, one last question. Okay, doesn't, okay, then I don't care. If it doesn't have to do with moths, I'm kidding. Okay, insects. Screw worms, yes. I know that they started spraying to kill the animal's mouth. And then it worked all the way up. Yeah. So one of the benefits, I guess, is that the deer population exploded. Mm. Is there anything, what, what has been the negative of that? Okay, so, yes. So a great question. I'm actually, and I'll repeat that. Don't worry for those in chat. So uh, screw worm eradication. Boy, my dad tells me about screw worms, and he tells me about just how horrible screw worms were. Um, and it goes back to this. That when John, that what John Muir says, when we pick out anything in the universe, we find it hitched to everything else. So because we eradicated or close to eradicated screw worms, the deer population boomed. And because of the deer population booming, um, a lot of our plants were defoliated, the browse lines, you saw the browse lines more often. And it actually does go back to moths and the idea of pesticides in general that any sort of action that we do, there are consequences to it. Some of those are benefit consequences, are what we view as a benefit. Okay, my plants are healthier because there are fewer bugs on them. So you, you do that sort of experiment of I'm using this pesticide for the plant because I want it to have more vibrant leaves or more flowers. It kills off all the bugs, which the birds don't have anything to feed their young at that spot. So there are those consequences. Um, Aldo Leopold has a great quote called thinking like a mountain. If you think like a mountain, first, first of all, it's beautiful. One of my, another one of my favorite books, Sand County Almanac by Aldo Leopold, beautiful, beautiful book. But he talks about when he hunted wolves, there were more deer. And he thought that was a good thing, right? It's good for hunting, more deer. But because there were more deer, there was less plants, there was less vegetation around. Because there was less vegetation, there were less bugs.
because there was less birds, it was more quiet. You didn't hear the birds as much. So it all came from that hunting of wolves that all, Le all the Leopold uh, had, that his main objective was to get more deer. But because of the more deer, there were all of these other consequences. So he calls it thinking like a mountain, that we think of something bigger than ourselves or a time frame that's longer than our own lives. So with the screwworms, going back to screwworms, it may have had something to do with that, the, the boom of the deer population. And our deer friends in the, in the hill country are experiencing some of that too. May not be primarily through the, the screwworms, but I'm sure that benefited it too. With moths, there are the corn earworms. And those can be, you've heard of those before. If you've ever uh, peeled back, uh, grow corn yourself and you peel back and there's that stupid caterpillar in there that's eating that filet mignon that we put out there. Uh, you know, really, when we plant these things, nature goes, wow, this is delicious, thank you. But the corn earworm produces those caterpillars. And yes, I wrestled with that myself. My dad grows corn, so we wrestled with it. But there are uh, consequences of removing that. That's one of the main diet of bats. And even on the Doppler radar, you can see the movement of both the corn earworms and of the bats that feed upon them. It's a pretty amazing. It's pretty amazing. If you Google um, bat migration or bat movement and moth movement, they actually pop up on the Doppler radar because there's so many of them. But the point is, and I'm, I'm going a long way to get to your point, is all the Leopold talks about thinking like a mountain. And whenever we remove something from the ecosystem, even though that's a maybe a good thing in the short term, there are consequences for, for that removal of something. So I, I challenge you, I encourage you, as a little bug is eating some of your plants, you know, maybe- okay, definitely. No more no more squash vines are getting eradicated. Okay, no more squash vines, oh yes, boy. Which is a beautiful moth, I didn't even talk about the squash vine or, um, but yeah, if you're able to sacrifice some of that, nature can respond. And maybe you have to listen to the whisper of a bird singing in the distance for that too. Um, it may cause, you know, some philosophical uh, struggles too, but I encourage you to, to try. Long way around that question. It's a good question though, buddy. Uh, again, here's my contact if, uh, if there's other. And so good to see you all. I hope that everybody is staying healthy, uh, staying um, happy to make sure to go outside, listen to nature. That's where we can escape from reality, if just for a moment. So thank you all so much. Thank you so much, Sam. Appreciate it. Um, next is, I've got a few announcements to make, if you can all hear me. Um, Barbara St. Clair has graciously arranged for a fundraiser with a Fish City Grill. They're going to donate 15% of their proceeds to Dallas County Master Gardener Association on Tuesday, December 7th. Um, 1130 in the morning until 9 p.m. at night. Take out uh, in-service restaurant, and it's the one on Skillman, 7170 Skillman Street, Dallas, Texas, 75231. So mark your calendars, and um, they do to-go orders too. So that's a great fundraiser for us. Thank you, Barbara. Um, also, Stephanie Susan Smith, who's not here, she wanted to let you know that Grow, Know, and Go, the monthly newsletter, um, she's looking for people to submit articles, and um, I will post that information at a, a later date, but um, just articles of things that might be interesting about what Master Gardeners are doing. And I have a shout out to all of our wonderful class captains who have gone above and beyond trying to keep us all sane in the last year and a half. So big shout out to them. 